All right, coming up at 5.30, it is a 35-year-old Supreme Court case that's getting new attention amidst the controversy at Rockville High School. Next, we are talking to a legal expert about how that 1981 decision is playing a role in all of this. Hey, Ronica. We serve all of our students when they come to us. And when we look at that, it is not only the right thing to do and the good thing to do, and it benefits the students and our community and our state, it's also the law of the land, and it's what all of the school systems in this state, and I would go as far as to say virtually, or all of them in the nation do. They serve the students that walk in the door. And that's based on Plyler v. Doe from the Supreme Court. That was Montgomery County School Superintendent Jack Smith. He was speaking yesterday at a press conference and responding to the intense backlash and questioning about how those two students accused of raping a 14-year-old in a school bathroom were allowed to even attend the school. One of them 17 years old, the other 18. They were both enrolled as freshmen. Both are immigrants from Central America. Now, back in 1982, a landmark decision that determined states cannot constitutionally deny students a free public education on account of their immigration status. It's called Plyler v. Doe. And joining me now to talk more about the case and how it applies to Montgomery County, this is Mark Levine, who's a Virginia State Delegate and a former congressional attorney. Mark, how are you? I'm good. How are you? All right. Uh, let's talk about, so uh, that's the first I heard of Plyler v. Doe yesterday when he brought it up during the press conference. Give us a sense of what, what, what is Plyler v. Doe? So Plyler v. Doe asked the question whether the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, where it says that yeah, right you ha I, I always have it with me, uh, it says that no person shall be denied the equal protection under the law. So there's certain rights we have as citizens, and there's certain rights we have as persons. And since people that are here, whether documented or not, are persons, they're allowed equal protection under the law. If the law requires that all children under a certain age be schooled, they are persons, they are schooled as well. And in fact, the Supreme Court goes on to say that if we were to treat them unfairly or differently, there would actually be consequences, not just for them, but for society. But the heart of the issue is equal protection. Because that's the one thing that came out after yesterday. And we had a, we had a guest on, Brigitte Mulliken, who was very staunchly opposed to the idea of having illegal uh, the students of illegal immigrants in in schools period what you're saying is the Constitution says that that's, that's just not possible. Well, it's required. Uh, you have to treat everyone equally under the law. And furthermore, it's a really bad policy idea, even if we were to consider amending the Constitution. When you think about it, these people are here. They're, they're not here due to any fault of their own. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of, of these kids come because their parents bring them over. And we really shouldn't, you can go to the Bible, you shouldn't blame children for the sins of their parents. In this case, to say we're going to leave them uneducated, leave them out in the street, not teach them English, yeah. that would actually cause a lot more crime, I think. So, so I mean, as we move forward with this, obviously, the, you know, the, Im the immigration uh, story has become front and center in this, especially since the night before the Maryland House of Delegates passed uh, what amounts to uh, sanctuary legislation. Uh, Governor Hogan says he wants no part of that. We're obviously going to follow that separately. It's, they're two separate cases. I feel like it, in this case, though, some people are conflating the two and saying it comes to a confluence of, of events. You know, the whole notion of sanctuary cities is really not the right idea. What, what, what the idea is that immigration officials focus on immigration law. Mm. State and local officials focus on state and local law. It's not the job of your local school teacher to be an immigration official. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she or he is not very good at it. That's, that's not what they're supposed to do. And immigration should focus on immigration. And I think that's really what they're doing. No one is breaking the law no, because there's no requirement for a school teacher to act as an informant to the immigration authority. Because that's one issue that a lot of people are bringing up. They're saying, OK, police, uh, you know, when we go back to the whole sanctuary argument, they're saying police should be deputized to, uh, to to do work on behalf of uh, immigration. They're saying, apparently in Montgomery County, why didn't the school officials do anything on this? You're well, I hope the federal government's going to pay us for all of that. If school officials are suddenly immigration officials, mm -hmm. they should be paid by the federal government. I think school teachers should be focused on teaching. Yeah. I think local police should be focused on crimes. If, In fact, if you want to stop a rape or you want to stop a violent crime in the community, the worst thing to do is to deputize local police officers as immigration officials because the people who are going to stop this crime are witnesses, often from the same community. Think of an undocumented immigrant who saw the crime take place. If she or he knows that the police officer is an immigration official, she'll never go to the police. The crime will never be captured. The, the perpetrator will never be captured. And there'll be a string of crimes throughout the community. The best way to stop these crimes is to get the people of the community, the vast, vast, vast majority of law-abiding, mm -hmm. to be able to witness and turn them in. And the irony is that 
undocumented immigrants commit crimes at a far lesser rate than American citizens. So really, you're focusing on this one, but every day, American citizens commit far, far more crimes at a far greater rate than the undocumented. But in this case, I would assume that you might get the frustration of a lot of people saying, and they're focusing on that on that fact. They're saying, okay, these students, there was an immigration detainer put out for one of them, and that seems to be what sparked the firestorm, whether or not it's, it, it's a wide-ranging issue or not. You know, if a red-headed person commits a rape, uh, we could say, if we would just keep all red-headed people out of schools, we could lessen rapes. But that doesn't make sense, because the vast majority of red-headed people aren't rapists. It's the same idea here. You can't in any way say that because 0.0001% is doing something, that suddenly we should harm all undocumented immigrants. That's actually the nature of prejudice. But I think in the grand scheme of things, when you look at what happened in Montgomery County, and, you know, social media, I mean, you know, social media just goes all over the place. I think in the grand scheme of things, we, we saw something very, very unfortunate and tragic happen in Maryland. And regardless of all the other circumstances, we hope that the best for that, that victim and, and the alleged victim and everybody else involved. Absolutely. Crime, crime is unfortunate. Tragedies happen. The best way to catch criminals is to treat everyone with respect so that people come forward and can be witnesses for those crimes. Mark Levine, thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Sarah, back over to you. All right. Thanks, Jim.